Well, uh, to meet the security and cryptography requirements of IoT devices or embedded systems, designers have multiple implementation choices. Here, to help define some of those choices, in a presentation titled How to Harden Your IoT Design with Hardware Security is Stefan DeVito, a product definer and security expert for Maxim Integrated's Micro Security and Software Business Unit. Stefan, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining this session. To meet the uh, security requirements of embedded systems, designers have multiple implementation choices. For example, if you consider an IoT device motioned by a microcontroller that does not integrate hardware security functions, including secure storage for keys and secrets, well, security functions could be implemented in software with this micro, but there is a risk that the device is reverse engineered or attacked in an effort to break the security. It turns out that pure software implementations would be relatively easy to compromise. An alternative is to utilize an externally attached dedicated hardware-based secure IC that provides a turnkey crypto toolbox suitable for the application and secure storage of sensitive data such as keys. Another strong option would be to use a secure micro which integrates hardware-based security to both control the IoT device and securely implement the cryptographic requirements. This presentation will present the benefits of both hardware-based solutions. So why do we need hardware-based security? The, these are some examples of problems that embedded system designers encounter as they are planning their system design. First one is the safety and reliability of their product in regards to concerns that a third-party clone could enter the ecosystem and not meet your customer's expectations and specifications. Second is key management. If data is encrypted and decrypted, it's important that the keys implementing this are protected so that the data remains secure. Third, secure boot with the risk of malicious software wrecking a VOC on entire systems. It's important to protect against this danger. Certificate and identity management are crucial to the security of the system as a whole to enable security in transactions. Bootstrapping the security also requires the injection of keys, certificates, and unique identities and needs to be considered. Business model protection is another concern, which is about protecting the revenue and the image of your company. Endpoint authentication and data security, securing the communication between the endpoint of a system or validating that the source of the information is an authentic part of the system is often a source of trouble. And last, role authentication is necessary to securely administrate devices. The security challenges come from attackers who have different profiles and motivations. They can be researchers who usually follow a responsible disclosure policy where the device manufacturer gets informed in advance so that they can patch the security hole. That's the good case. They can be mafia organizations stealing valuable data on a large scale. They can be competitors or opportunists copying products and grabbing your market shares with cheaper, lower quality goods. They can be rogue organizations trying to disrupt another country's infrastructure with distributed denial of service attacks targeting various critical information services by flooding servers with requests coming from hacked IoT devices. Don't let your device be part of criminal actions. In order to mitigate the threats posed by attackers, regulations and standards are appearing. Different regions in the world and different kinds of markets like medical or industrial connected devices now have to follow various rules and guidelines. Those standards define information security goals and different security levels. These security goals are defined based on a threat analysis, that is, what do you need to protect, against whom, at what cost. In addition to those security goals, big security requirements are expressed in those standards. 
One is life cycle management. Life cycle management is about making sure that you have a good security level across the various steps of the supply chain, and this is not an easy task. And the other big requirement is hardware-based security. Industry standards such as IEC 62443 for the IO Industrial IoT systems explicitly require hardware-based security implementations at their highest levels. And with this presentation, we will understand why. So how do you secure your embedded device with hardware security? In fact, no reliable route of trust can be implemented using software only uh, because integrating cryptography has risks. Where does the cryptographic algorithm implementation comes from? Is it resistant to side channel analysis like a DPA? Is it well verified? Does it have any backdoor? And where do you store the keys? Non-fully secure microcontrollers with crypto accelerators may pose risks as well. They may have better performance, but are they secure enough? And again, where do you store the keys in, in those micros? Pure software will bring you no temper resistance. How do you prevent the extraction of your keys from the flash memory of your microcontroller? And also, how do we implement the side channel or glitch countermeasures? It can be done in software, but it's costly in terms of code size and performance, and also it's difficult. And most of the time, you will not find those countermeasures in publicly available cryptographic algorithm implementations. And overall, uh, your system has a larger attack surface because if you mix the application of the device with the security functions, then everything gets you know mixed and exposed. And last but not least, how do you bootstrap the security? How do you inject the keys in the device? Those are big questions. And here we see that even relatively well implemented software security is not going to be strong enough. I really want to show you why simple software cannot be secure enough. Attackers have a range of methods and tools to break a system. From remote, they can try to leverage weaknesses of the communication protocol that is logic errors in your implementation, leaving access to sensitive data, or buffer overflow errors, allowing code injection, etc. Software is usually a, a collection of third-party code with you know, uneven verification, and thorough verification is a difficult task. And usually the first step in finding a vulnerability in a system is through a thorough analysis of the device, that is physically speaking. An attacker will want to reverse the firmware to find existing vulnerabilities that can be further remotely exploited. They will also going to try to extract keys or passwords, granting special privileges on your device, allowing to decrypt the traffic, to clone the device, or to reconfigure them, including flashing an alternative firmware. Attacks can be cheap and quick on systems that are not secure enough even without tearing the device down. For, in, for example, extracting keys through differential power analysis, DPA, does not require a very high-end equipment on a naive AES implementation. Glitch attacks can even break trust zone-based Cortex M microcontrollers for a quite small budget. Opening the device to look for debug interfaces, disorder and dump memories, probe PCB traces is not very expensive either. Some micros have some level of protection. However, perturbation attacks are really powerful yet affordable. A simple glitch on the power supply, like uh, some people did on all arcade games to get more credits, can bypass the security configuration. It may take some time for an attacker to find the right spot, but the risk, the risk is high. In well-designed systems, resisting basic attacks, attackers can go further if it's financially worth. They can attack the microcontroller itself at the silicon level. The microcontroller can be depackaged 
Its internal memories can be dumped with an electron microscope. And internal microcircuit traces can be probed. The circuit can be modified. So now we see why adding a AES library to your code is not enough to secure your device communications. And now I'd like to emphasize on the key storage. Indeed, embedded devices that do not leverage hardware security are exposed to the extraction of secrets from their memories. As I just explained, if attackers find no good way to dump memories of your device using classical tools, such as a J JTAG probe, they can go up to the direct extraction of the flash memory with an electron microscope. On the picture, we see that we see contrast differences between cells containing zeros and ones after some preparation of the sample. For sure, it's not cheap and fast, but with that, there's a good chance that your application secrets will be eventually extracted. And by the way, renting an electron microscope costs $100 per hour, and the complete reading of the flash takes a few hours. Reverse engineering work is required after that to figure out the layout of the data, but keys can be spotted because you know, they, they look highly random. So in this sea of bits, it's possible to, to actually extract the keys. So now let's see how hardware-based security prevents all sorts of attacks on the embedded systems that cannot be mitigated with software only. Adding security ICs in your design will give you access to cryptographic engines that resist glitch attacks and side channel analysis give you access to true and secure random number generators that provide good entropy no matter the conditions, and that's essential for cryptographic protocols. You're gonna get temper resistant and evident secure storage, which is highly difficult to break. You're gonna have the guarantee of a unique ID, essential for secure identification. And also you're gonna get a secure key management scheme the fact that those ICs have a reduced function set makes their attack surface minimum too, because complexity is the enemy of security. And last but not least, implementing security in a dedicated IC isolates it from the application running in the main processor, and that reduces the number of attack paths. So let's see. Uh, and some examples of embedded security devices from Maxim. So Maxim has a 30 year old experience in security with secure micros for financial terminals, point of sales, ATMs, and FIT 140 modules. And Maxim also has a broad portfolio of secure authenticators for anti-cloning, data authentication, secure key exchange. More than 3 billion of such chips has, has been shipped so far. And Maxim has accumulated knowledge to implement hardware countermeasures against invasive and non-invasive attacks. One of the latest innovation is the chip DNA, a physically unclonable function. I think it's important to talk a little bit about chip DNA because this technology is rather unique. It's a physically unclonable function which is a circuit with an unpredictable but repeatable output. And this circuit evaluates intrinsic characteristics of an electronic structure, such as the current and voltage characteristics of an analog structure. And those characteristics are highly random by nature because of natural and avoidable manufacturing process variations from chip to chip and wafer to wafer. So those analog mismatches of uh, the puff elements circuit, they produce bit values that build a cryptographic key. The good thing is that measuring those with an external probe disturbs the measurement and makes it impossible to extract from the chip. And therefore, the cloning of the chip and the extraction of the key is extremely difficult, even virtually impossible. 
it's highly reliable though because the chips are, have been tested over process, temperature, aging, voltage. So we are sure that the same key is going to be regenerated every time. However, it's impossible to observe the key externally. So as a result, the key exists only when needed. The chip generates the key when needed, it uses it for decrypting internal memory, for instance, and then destroys the key from the volatile memory. So the key does not exist anymore in the chip. And for embedded security, it's very good to use this technology to encrypt the internal memory. So all your secrets stored in the flash of the security IC are protected with this key that virtually does not exist when uh, not in use. Uh, let's quickly see two examples of hardware security integration with the Maxim DS28S60 Secure Authenticator and the Max 52520 Secure Micro. I think the um, Maxim DS28S60 can really help increase your security very simply in your embedded device. Uh, this is the example of a temperature sensor embedding the DS28S60. Uh, this one is a companion security IC plugged on the SPI interface that will add security functions to your embedded device. Uh, it's going to bring you secure storage protected with the chip DNA technology. It brings ECGS authentication for secure identity of your embedded device. And it has AES GCM encryption. Uh, which also provides authentication, by the way, for secure communication. Uh, the chip is protected against side channel and glitch attacks, as well as invasive silicon level attacks. It's very easy to add into an existing system on the SPI interface, uh, thanks to its small footprint. Also, it has a little impact on the power consumption and is also a good fit for radio-based sensors. In addition, it comes with a small convenient software library to give your microcontrollers application access to the security functions easily and also to abstract the low-level communication protocol. So in this design, in this example of implementation, uh, the DS28 makes it possible to securely connect the sensor to some cloud services through various technologies, network technologies. And here we took the example of uh, the LoRa network. Thanks to the uh, ECDH key exchange protocol, the same AES key can be agreed upon in the DS28 S60 and in the cloud server application without being revealed anywhere else. So the uh, AES key is then used to encrypt and sign all the temperature measurements of the sensor sent to the server. Note that the DS28S60 can come pre-programmed with keys and certificates to remove the burden of, on your manufacturing process. I think it's also important to highlight the Max32520 uh, with its innovative slave serial flash interface and also the chip DNA technology. First, it can be used as a standalone secure microcontroller that includes both the security functions and the IoT device application. And that works because the Max32520 has its secure internal flash protected with chip DNA. Therefore, all the secrets can be stored there safely. Besides the 32520 secure boot for the internal firmware, and it also has secure AES and ECDSA engines that can be easily used through the provided software development kit. And again, it has all the required countermeasures against glitch attacks, side channel analysis, and all sorts of invasive attacks. It even has a external temper detection circuit that can be used to monitor the integrity of the embedded device enclosure itself. So if you open the device, you may have a security reaction in case it's needed. But this micro can also be used as a companion chip. And in that case, it's gonna be in charge of the security functions of your embedded device. 
it can interface with the main microcontroller through SPI, I2C, UART. And it even has a standard flash interface. So it can be seen as a flash memory circuit from the main microcontroller standpoint. Um, this is useful for a secure boot scenario when the main microcontroller boots off an external flash. In that case, this embedded device microcontroller would not be able to fetch non-trusted code since the MAC32520 verifies the integrity and authenticity of its flash before ena enabling that external flash interface. And again, this chip has a low power consumption, so that fits radio enabled devices and the footprint is quite minimal as well. So integration is uh, rather easy in your system. Uh, in a few words, how do we compare software security versus security implemented with a hardware secure element that is a discrete IC that you plug into your system? versus security completely implemented in a secure microcontroller that mixes the security functions and your application. Well, in terms of turnkey solution, for sure, adding a secure element gives you security functions out of the box. Integration is very easy. On a secure micro, it's maybe less easy because you have to integrate your application software with uh, the security software, but Still, you have all the security facilities in place. If you go the software security way, then you need to integrate various security libraries from here and there, and you have to test everything. So the integration time, the implementation time is usually larger. For device level security, well, it depends on the architecture, I guess, but if you use a hardware secure element, security level is very high because you physically isolate the security functions from the rest of the application. So that already minimizes the uh, attack surface of the security part. And it's even true for a secure microcontroller because even though the application is contained within the same micro, the crypto implemented in hardware can be and very hardly compromised. In order to reach compliance with standards, software security is a no-go in certain cases, and you need to have hardware security that's mandated. So you're using a secure element or a secure micro is mandatory in that case. In terms of attack resistance, well, software security doesn't help. It's always possible to dump your firmware and extract secrets from a flash memory, whereas with hardware security, uh, physical extraction of data is uh, virtually impossible. And that's also true for side channel and glitch resistance. You can do some mitigation in software, but it's very difficult to implement, difficult to test, and it badly impacts the performance. Whereas with hardware crypto, you get well-tested, well-designed, secure uh, cryptographic engines uh, which already provide those characteristics to you and you don't have to to think about it. Secure boot is also very important. Uh, depending on your microcontroller, it might be provided and it might not be provided. With hardware secure solutions, it's usually part of the solution, so that helps a lot as well. In terms of secure identity, well, performance, sorry, uh, I guess I've described it already. Uh, hardware implementation are usually faster than pure software implementations when it comes to cryptography. Secure identity, it's also about having a unique ID in your device and most, if not all, hardware security IC come with a unique ID injected in the factory by the silicon manufacturer. So that's also very good to create a unique identity for your device, uh, which can be proven using digital signature. And last but not least, the pre-programming of the chips. Uh, when using a regular microcontroller, well, it's possible. I mean, you have this 
uh, free programming service usually available. But as you have no specific security in the chip, it's difficult to figure out where to inject the keys in the programming and manufacturing process. When using security chips, uh, you can ask the silicon vendor uh, to pre-program your chips and this way they come already secure in your supply chain and that increases a lot the overall security across the life cycle of the of the product. So what you don't need to worry about when using hardware security ICs uh, is to learn how to implement cryptography. You don't need to learn side channel attacks, glitch attacks. You don't have to wonder how to hide your keys in memory. Uh, you don't need to worry about impacting the performances and the footprint of your existing application. And you don't need to worry about your time to market. And also related to that, uh, no worries about failing the implementation of your security functions and passing security certifications. And now as a conclusion, So this is what you get with hardware security solutions. Uh, you're going to get a turnkey solution with pre-verified cryptography, real temporal resistance, true random number generators, a secure key management scheme, and a set of security mechanisms that counter threats on your system. It's going to be easier to comply with standards and fulfill their hardware security requirements. And also the proof of security of your system is made easier because you have isolated security functions from the rest of the application. Therefore, you're gonna have a reduced time to market. Uh, no tough learning curve. There is less risk of security breaches. The assessment work uh, to assess your security is gonna be reduced. And overall, the integration in your system is easier because it's like plugging a security addition to, to your system. And the supply chain security and convenience for you is going to be higher thanks to the pre-programming of the parts. And that was my presentation. Thank you for attending. <laughs>